Hello and welcome to Vodcast 1.3. And I am digging this rock and roll track we got underneath the sound here. Anyway, this is the final Vodcast for Chapter 1. And this one is all about silicate and non-silicate minerals. Alright, let's start off by talking about silicate minerals. If you would focus your attention to the center of the screen, take a look at the pretty busy pie chart that you see. The two most common elements in Earth's crust are oxygen and silicon, and they are by far the two most abundant elements in Earth's crust. Now, whenever we're talking silicates, we are talking about minerals that must contain silicon and oxygen. The silicate minerals are the most common minerals in Earth's crust. An important question to ask is, how do silicate minerals form? Well, put as concisely as possible, they form when molten rock cools. Now, if you're not 100% sure what molten rock is, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next podcast series. When we're talking molten rock, we're typically talking things like lava, magma, and igneous rocks. It's certainly worth stating that all the information you see on the left is very, very important information to know for the sake of quizzes and tests and other assessments. But also focus your attention to the far right side of this slide. The silicon oxygen tetrahedron, which as shown represents a little three-dimensional pyramid, is the building block for all silicate minerals. In the expanded view of the silicon oxygen tetrahedron, you'll see the silicon ion at the very center of the pyramid, and then at each corner of the pyramid is an oxygen ion. In terms of chemical formula here, we're talking SiO4, but basically the way we string that little pyramid-shaped building block together creates the huge variety of silicate minerals that exist. Let's take a look at some examples of silicate minerals. For the first one, I have an image, but I also have a sample in my possession. Let's take a look at muscovite. The picture shows that with a knife blade, you can actually slice little sheets of muscovite, and they can form these really thin, fragile layers. Now I'm here to tell you, I have a piece of muscovite here, and I don't need a knife blade to do this. Here's muscovite as it looks in its head-on view. And here's a nice little side profile just to show you how thin this particular sample is. Now I'm going to rotate it around and I hope you can see nice and closely the layers that exist inside of this muscovite sample. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to peel off one of the layers because the weak bonds in this muscovite sample run side to side. They run horizontally and I'll have no trouble grabbing onto this little corner down here and look at that and peeling off what looks almost like a fish scale. Now this is a great example of cleavage in one direction. The weak bonds all lie in the same direction parallel to one another and I could peel off layer after layer after layer of this muscovite sample if I really wanted to. We've talked at pretty good length about quartz but because it's one of my favorite minerals I thought I'd show you a couple extra pictures just for good measure. Shown is smoky quartz, rose quartz, milky quartz, and even jasper. And although we've encountered some of these in previous videos, I just wanted to stress to you that quartz is a silicate mineral. Quartz's chemical formula is SiO2, which should not be confused with the silicon oxygen tetrahedron's formula of SiO4. And lastly, at the far right side of this slide, we see some pictures of feldspars. What's worth noting here is that feldspars are the most abundant silicate minerals. They are found in enormous quantities and quite a few varieties too. I'd like to provide a little bit greater depth when it comes to some examples of silicate minerals. And there are some really important concepts on this slide that I think need to be emphasized. The first thing that I'd like to point out is that the silicon oxygen tetrahedron we saw on the first slide, that little pyramid shaped building block, well, it's the functional unit for all of the minerals and groups shown on this slide. I want you to focus especially on the silicate structure column in this image. For all of the different groups of silicate minerals, the unifying theme is that the little silicon oxygen tetrahedron is the building block for all of them. Now let's talk about cleavage because I think there's some very important conceptual considerations here on this slide. Because I just demonstrated how muscovite is a great example of cleavage in one plane, let's take a look at the silicate structure that is representative of muscovite. It looks kind of like a honeycomb. But what I want you to ask yourself is, if you had to cut straight across at any possible angle, what would be the easiest route if you had to cut through this silicate structure? Your first thought might be to cut vertically up and down, but that's not a good idea because no matter where you would orient your little hypothetical knife blade, you're gonna have to run through a lot of those little silicon oxygen tetrahedrons to do so. And that's not gonna be easy to do. Take a look at the horizontal direction though. If you were to cut horizontally from left to right or from right to left, across the silicate structure right here, 
there aren't many atoms in the way to provide resistance. And it's in this horizontal direction that the bonds are the weakest for all of the members of the mica family. And then for another conceptual reinforcement of cleavage, take a look at hornblende. I have a sample of hornblende right here in my possession. And as I stated in my first vodcast, hornblende is one of the three minerals that makes up granite. It's going to be the mineral that makes up the darker pieces that you see when you look at granite rock. Hornblende has cleavage in two planes at 60 degrees and 120 degrees. And although you might be thinking I'm just going to cut horizontally through, you'll see that there are actually three atoms you would run across. See the three red spheres? But if you were to cut at a 60 degree angle, so imagine holding the knife blade vertical but then tilting it slightly to either the left or to the right, what you'd see is you'd only have to run through two atoms to cleave hornblende if you take the path shown. That's why Hornblen has two cleavage planes at 60 degrees and 120 degrees. The bonds in Hornblen are weakest at those two particular angles. One other point I'd like to make on this slide is that olivine has a really simple silicate structure. It's basically just a bunch of scattered silicon oxygen tetrahedra pieces. We will talk about olivine in much greater depth in the next series of podcasts because it's an extremely important part of the discussion when we talk about igneous rocks, Bowen's reaction series, and things of that nature. The last consideration in this vodcast are the non-silicate minerals. Now keep in mind, the silicate minerals are the dominant minerals in Earth's crust, and it's not even close. The non-silicates make up only about 8% of Earth's crust, and although they don't occur in huge amounts compared to silicate minerals, they are still very, very important, especially when we talk about their economic uses. You probably have some familiarity with a lot of these minerals shown. For the carbonates, we've looked at a calcium sample. For the halides, We've looked at halite on more than one occasion in previous podcasts. As an example of an oxide, I showed you a sample of magnetite, which has the really cool property of being highly magnetic. For the sulfides mineral group, I showed you a sample of galena. And there are also two other non-silicate mineral groups to consider, the sulfates and the native elements. As an educator, one of the most important things I like to stress are the real world implications of what you're teaching. I don't really think it's necessary to memorize the chemical formulas on this slide. I don't think it's really necessary to memorize what each particular mineral sample looks like, but what I do think is important is understanding the real world relevance of the stuff that we're learning. For instance, the carbonate mineral group is essential for the production of cement and lime. The halides are used for steel making, and they're also used as fertilizer, and that's something that impacts all of us living here in the Midwest. Your oxides are essential for the production of iron, so for me as somebody who loves to lift weights, I have non-silicate minerals to thank for my gains. The sulfides produce ores of lead and zinc and copper and mercury. And all of those elements have very important industrial and economic value. The sulfates allow us to produce plaster and drilling mud. And then when you take a look at the native elements, we could start off by talking about gold and diamond. Who doesn't love gold and diamond, right? Talk about bling. But let's not forget about copper, which is a periodic table superstar when it comes to electrical conductivity. And it might be easy to overlook sulfur, but sulfur has very important pharmaceutical uses. And it's also really important for a variety of industrial chemistry processes. For any folks interested in photography, silver plays a pretty important role in that. And how can we forget about graphite? Because who could imagine a world without pencils? Makes me sick to my stomach just thinking about it. Okay, that concludes our first wave of video podcasts. We're now gonna shift our attention to the rock cycle as well as igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, and metamorphic rocks.